I don't know if this is the volume here. Yeah, that's right. There's feedback, definitely. Okay, I, I can keep talking. Um, so the critique of this new direction focuses on the inequalities that often accompany such an approach. In North Kenwood, Oakland, it is the middle and upper income newcomers who are best positioned to take advantage of new schools envisioned under the rubric of what's often called or sometimes called the entrepreneurial state. These data, as I've shown, show lower proportions of students on free and reduced lunch in the two new schools and the elementary school and the one new high school and the better test score. So we see that choice allows family, families with more resources to get into the better performing schools. So that's the first motivation coming out of the most recent uh, research that I did. And this is the second motivation for the research. Um, this is a postcard uh, sent out by the Chicago Renaissance Schools Fund, which is an organization that collects um, civic, collects uh, money from private <coughs> firms, usually, for new schools in Chicago. Not just charter schools, but a whole number of new schools under what's called Renaissance 2010. And the reason why this photograph caught my attention is because that is the pr president and CEO of Urban Prep Charter Academy, which you heard in the bio, I'm a member of the board, and that's a student at Urban Prep. And the um, first line of the thing was, a quality education isn't a privilege, and I wanted to say it's a right or something along those lines, but I think I won't make you pay the guessing game. Uh, it's a choice. And so when I saw this, being involved in urban prep and having written about charter schools and choice even in the first book and having my own reservations, to see this made me have even more reservations. So it made me want to study this idea of choice and the ubiquity of choice in public policy and try to think about what are some of the ideological foundations and what work does it do, what are some of the results um, in some of the public policies that we're, that we're undertaking now. So the research has three concerns. Um, the project is both conceptual and empirical. Uh, so the first is choice as an ideology, and I'll talk a little bit about that today. Uh, second is choice as the policy mechanism for improving the lives of low-income families and addressing racial inequalities, especially the second part, this focus on racial inequalities and racial segregation, is most explicit in the housing choice field. And so I'll talk about that housing choice, and especially housing choice vouchers, as a way to break down um, severe racial segregation in the housing market. So I'll give some, I'll talk about some um, uh, data for points number one and two, and then choice in practice. So I will talk about preliminary research, some focus group, group research, and some interview-based research that's still in the process of being analyzed, but I guess I'll give some nuggets and tidbits for today that hopefully we can talk about together. This is not the way the slide looked on my computer, but <laughs> like it is here. Um, so in the longer version of the talk, I walk through various ideological foundations of choice as integrally connected with concepts like freedom and with the commitment to capitalist markets. So here you see I'm going to be talking about markets, choice, and freedom. And many of the people who talk about choice especially are really making subtextual arguments about capitalism, about markets, and about freedom. In that work, in the longer version, I begin with economist Milton Friedman. And I probably could begin much further uh, in kind of liberal philosophy more generally, but I begin, I begin with Milton Friedman there. Today, I'll focus on another component of that discussion, with Friedman always in the shadows, using the work of economists Richard Thaler and legal scholar Cass Sunstein in their well-regarded book, Nudge. And I'll use that as the springboard for understanding some of the assumptions underlying choice policy. The connection of choice to both markets and freedom permeates nudge. In the book, the authors advocate for what they call libertarian paternalism, or the combination of the notions that, quote, first, people should be free to do what they like. That's the libertarian part. And I'll come back to this statement, people should be free to do what they like. I'll come back to this statement later. And number two, that there should be, quote, self-conscious efforts by institutions in the private sector and also by government to steer people's choices in directions that will improve their lives. So that's the paternalism part. So people should be free to do what they want, but the government and the private sector can steer people's choices in directions that will improve their lives, the paternalism part. They say, quote, libertarian paternalists care about freedom. Here they make a clear connection between choice and choice being the route to a certain kind of freedom. However, unlike Friedman, who promotes an ideal type of choice without limits, 
Thaler and Sunstein don't believe that there is a such thing as unfettered choice. Instead, all arrangements of goods and services will necessarily induce some behaviors and constrain others. For example, we don't do things like randomly dump an inventory of shoes in the middle of a department store and say, go at it. We, in fact, organize those shoes in some logical ways. We put all the sizes together, or we put them in pairs, first of all, style and size, and then we might organize them. Some store manager usually organizes them by some other logic. It might be designer shoes in one section and bargain shoes in another, or it might be dress shoes in one section, casual shoes in another, or it might be put all the size nines together, all the size sevens together, all the size sixes together. Thaler and Sunstein demonstrate that any decision about how to organize the shoes forms the, quote, architecture of, not shoe shopping, but choice. But in this case, the architecture of shoe shopping, or the architecture of choice. Choices exist within an architecture which people and sometimes computer models are, with people and sometimes computer models as the architects. So while Thaler and Sunstein want to maintain the freedom to choose, they recognize that few choices are completely freely made or made without the framing of these choice architects. So they put a lot of emphasis on the importance of choice architects to get people to make good choices. That's again the libertarian paternalism. Thaler and Sunstein's preferred approach to markets is that they utilize this smart choice architecture. The authors have a critique of markets because, because their end goal, Thaler and Sunstein's end goal, is to produce outcomes, good outcomes for as many people in the areas of, and they subtitled their book this, health, wealth, and happiness. This goal, health, wealth, and happiness, is not the primary aim of markets, however, which instead strive for profits. The two can come in conflict. Thaler and Sunstein note, quote, even when we're on our way to making good choices, competitive markets find ways to get us to overcome our last shred of resistance to bad ones. <laughs> Thaler and Sunstein do not advocate eliminating or banning the bad things from the market because that would be straight paternalism. Instead, libertarian paternalists nudge us consumers to make better choices, which will ultimately affect the array of goods provided by the market. Yet while Thaler and Sunstein are obviously concerned with promoting well-being, I would argue that actually their promotion of well-being is secondary to their commitment to the protection of choice. Thaler and Sunstein end their chapter on school choice, for example, with the following quote, quote, FDR's right to a good education is not a part of the Constitution, but it has become a cultural commitment, and a few simple steps could enable many more children to enjoy that right. The author's few simple steps are allowing more choices. But choice is also not in the Constitution. There is no right to choice, just as there is no right to an education or to many of the other social welfare goods that they see as desired outcomes. Thaler and Sunstein posit that choice is the method of, of securing the cultural commitment to the right of education, and presumably a quality education. And I would say that's one possibility, that choice is this lever is one possibility, but it's a possibility with which I disagree. I would argue that choice is anathema to moving policymaking in the direction of a rights discourse, and in particular, a socioeconomic rights discourse, because choice reemphasizes the libertarian leanings of a rights discourse that focuses on the freedom, the, uh, the libertarian le uh, leanings of the freedom discourse that focuses on the freedom from the state. So there's a long uh, discussion in constitutional law and constitutional history and in uh, liberal philosophy about freedom really being freedom from the state, what we sometimes time call sometimes call negative freedoms, as opposed to pro positive freedoms, which is what we sometimes call rights. 